So I had someone again approach me about taking a look at how their body's positioned, how their structure's lined up. And I, of course, said yes, because I was interested, because it was an interesting case. And this one happens to be a good exercise in how do you figure things out when there's no clear inciting incident, no, no like specific cause. It wasn't a car accident. Nothing fell on the person. They didn't fall off anything. You know, there wasn't a specific surgery that preceded all of this. So it's a good exercise in figuring out what the issue is without an obvious cause. Now, that being said, there are obvious issues if you really look at them. Uh, obvious, you know, and I have to admit, a lot of the time it takes a bit more work than this one did just to figure out all the squiggly stuff that's going on here. But in this case, there's really obvious structural problems. And what has likely happened is that these are many small injuries throughout the body that have basically been compounding over time. And the time is the time is key. Time's a big deal. It's been a while. And it's even though it's small, individually, I'm gonna say this, individually, none of these things are a huge problem. On their own, they could have been, they could be completely fine. But the fact is over time they've accumulated, they've built up, and as a whole, they've come together to form something bigger, something that's more of a problem now. Small motion losses, not a problem. Many, many small motion losses can add up to be a major functional loss. Not in all cases, but this one it seems to have, by my judgment. Anyways, we're going to identify some of these immobilities at first. We're going to trace them out left to right, right to left, back to front. All of that, actually. All of that. And then we're going to tie it all together in hopefully a way that makes sense. We're going to figure out where they're positioned and what's holding in place, what soft tissues might be involved in that process. And at the end, hoping it's going to make sense, hopefully it's going to be something someone can look at and say, hey, Okay, I can I can use that to either learn or someone who can actually help this person. They can actually use it as a bit of a guide, not the sole guide, but a bit of a guide to helping this person move better and feel better. Because that's, you know, that's the real goal, right? End of the day, that's what we want to do. Let me get rid of a few of these things. But first, before I do any of that, I need a disclaimer. I'm not a doctor. That should be clear. None of this is medical advice or a real diagnosis for educational and artistic purposes only. I have to do this at a distance. They asked me to do this at a distance. I have their permission. We're very far apart. We will probably never meet. So I can only use images and videos, no direct palpation. And that means I'm going to make some guesses, educated guesses, but they will be guesses and some of them will be wrong. I'm okay with that. Hopefully you are too. We should be fine anyways. So, I'm just going to bring up the main issues slash cases. This is just, this is big, but it's not as much as you think it is. A lot of it is just eliminating bigger problems. What you're going to find as we go through this is, is nothing's hugely a problem, but as a whole, yeah, we, we got some stuff going on. Okay, first one, no traumatic injuries. I kind of said that one already. But we did have many, many small injuries as a kid, so many things that happened. But in his own words, he was able to sleep it off. That's an expression. It just means he <laughs> may have been a bit injured. Went to bed, woke up the next morning. You're a kid. You can get away with this. You felt better. This is this is a young guy. I'll tell you, this is this is a younger younger guy, and so he's at that age, unlike some of us, who, uh, you know. You can't just sleep things off as easily. I don't want to complain, but, you know, that's that's reality that hits you at one point or another. Anyways, he did do some weightlifting in college and had self-described bad form. And that's pretty typical. And really, you know, you get away with a lot of that when you're younger, but it may cause problems later in life for some of us. In this case, it may very well have. Symptomatically, what he's experiencing, one of the main complaints, shoulder, neck, jaw, upper chest, are always feeling tight. Now, in this case, we know it's not a pathologic thing. That's been screened for. We're okay there. In addition to that, we also have a shoulder instability. 
with crepitus, that's just a fancy word, crepitus, fancy word for clunking, clicking. Clicking is probably a better word, but clunking around. And it's 2009, that's, that's a good while now, it's, so it's, it's unstable. And we've also got some hips that feel unstable, so we've got a bunch of sensational things going on, musculoskeletal stuff, so far. Now, interestingly, we've got a genuine leg length discrepancy, and that is the left one that's that's longer, comparatively right short. And that's actually been proven. A lot of the times, you'll get people coming in, or you'll meet, you'll meet people, and they'll say, oh, i got a leg length discrepancy. And it's just because someone took some tape measure, or they looked at you where you're laying down, and, and it kind of looks like that. This one's an actual proven x-ray thing, like it, it takes a lot of work. If you just look at the legs when a person's laying down, it's not an accurate read. In addition to that, and, and rightfully so, there is a mild scoliosis, and this is less than or equal to 5 degrees, which is really small. That's that's not a big worry. It, it may be something that in, in later years or currently, you know, just if you go to the right therapist, you may need a heel lift. It might not, though. These things are, these things are sometimes pr pretty mild, and you can get away with it. You've met people, and they didn't even know it. You've met people that have length length discrepancies, and they have no need for help whatsoever, and they're fine. Some of them are superhumans. I don't get it either. But anyways, this is, this is a real scoliosis, and it's a real leg length discrepancy. That's important to, to understand, because it kind of sets your bar. Big things here. I separated these. Can't seem to improve posture by himself. That's a big deal to me, and doesn't feel safe to exercise. These are both really important things. When it comes to posture, what you really have to understand is there's a ton of things that go into the posture. It really, you could say every part of your body goes into you standing up straight effectively. And though it's okay to slouch, the reality is slouching is not the worst thing ever, as long as you don't do an excessive amount of it, of course, and, and you don't expect to be doing high intensity stuff afterwards either. But slouching isn't bad, but you should always have the ability to stand up relatively straight. Not perfect at all times at any age, but you should have the ability to stand up relatively straight. So the fact that he cannot get into a good position of posture is identifying that something, in fact, likely several things, are off. And the second one here does not feel safe to exercise. That to me, that's bad. I, I don't like, I don't like hearing that too much because you know we can say all we want about the hands-on therapy world. It's, I, I think it's essential. I think it's important. But a person at some point has to take on safe exercise to maintain health and to maintain stability like long term you got to have some exercise and that's dependent on the person you know not everybody has to lift weights there can be walking there can be swimming there's all kinds of different exercises but if you don't feel safe exercising it means you don't feel safe getting around even and that's not a good place to be anyways pop up a few more of these things keep it going so back to our static views here. I've got a few videos. Back to our static views. The one thing that jumped out to me right away, bugged me in fact, was this right foot. Something about this foot, you know, it, it sh you know what, things that are, that are out should irritate you a little bit. This foot is kind of turned out. Both are a little bit out. I'll show you a walking video in just a sec. But it's not just out. It's as if it was collapsed. So it's like the arches drop down a bit on that side so it's lost a little bit of that height not not doing too great here either but not only that we actually have what you could call at this point i'm just going to for simplicity's sake call it an abducted foot so it's if from the ankle the foot's being taken away from the body by definition abduction and what bugs me about it so much what really bugs me about this this position of this foot is that the rest of the leg appears relatively fine you know what you should really kind of expect to see is some kind of an angular change when you get an isolated foot thing like this like the knee should be doing that and we should get kind of a, a lateral strain of the tibia what a, a genu valgus type of strain that's what you expect to see but we're not getting that here and again that should bug you because it means that the body is 
isolating on this kind of single area. The reality is the body almost always wants to work together when it can, when it's relatively safe to do so. So whether that's the, the hips loading and kind of doing this and going side to side and backwards and forwards, it wants to work together in, in reciprocating curves. And when we don't see that, something's wrong. Something's kind of definitely wrong. I can't really get a good look at the foot, again, by video or picture, but I know for sure that just because it is in the way it is, something has to be done eventually. But we're going to look at the way the, the foot is loaded too. Let me just load up a quick video here. So this is just a walking down a hallway thing. Very, very simple. Just look at, just look at the way the feet are turned outward with the step. Look at the way the feet are positioned to the outside. The toes are out by relation, the heels are, are slightly inward. It's not a big deal, but again, at this age, we shouldn't be seeing too much of this happening. So this is significant. It's showing external rotation of both legs. So going back to our main picture, the legs, we could say realistically, we've got external rotation of the whole thing, and that means the hips on either side. These as well are externally rotated. I've drawn a very large greater canter there, but you get the idea. So these are basically spun back. Again, because I'm not seeing a ton in the knee here, I'm not seeing a ton of structural change in the knee. I'm guessing it is these guys more than anything, these the actual hip joints that are externally rotated. One thing worth mentioning, and I'm not going to show this video simply because uh, it shows a face, and I don't want to do that for confidentiality purposes. But one thing he mentions about his right knee, again, the same as a foot problem, uh, when he has his feet together, we, did, we just did this, we did uh, different bending over with the feet, toes together, and heels apart. With his right knee, he has a lot of trouble straightening it. That's that's a big deal. So it's at a slight bend compared to the left. The left is the one pointing at us in this particular case, in this, this part of the image. But he's having some kind of a functional trouble in the right knee. Now, for now, it might be that we don't have any structural problems, but those could show up later, like a, a funny position of the knee. For now, again, look even looking at it from the back here, those legs look... I'll say relatively straight. Again, you can see some of the see some of the stuff that's starting to go on here, for sure on the the posterior side. But that being said, nothing major up here. Foot sticks out. That's a big deal. Let me get rid of some of that. Then one last thing I want to mention from this image, just look, this, he thinks he's straight, you know, I, I don't really ask people to do a perfect straight, but I say just one image from the front, one image from the side, one image from the back, just to start out. Okay, two images left and right side, but in this case, look at the twist already going on through here. And someone who thinks they're relatively straight, look at the twist kind of coming through the body and the angle of those shoulders and the direction of the gaze. Look at all that going on right off the bat. Again, these things, you should notice them. You should be aware of them. And so we have to take these into account. I'm going to back this up further as we get to the poster reviews and some of the movements. But that being said, it will, uh, it will already st it's already starting to show up. Okay, moving on to a lateral view. Now, this is a bit of an upshot, but already you should notice the height of the shoulder. Already we're looking like it's a little bit squashed, like this is this is coming up, and the head and neck are in a relative down position. Not actually, the head's in a the head is fine. It's not like we're crushing the head, but the shoulders are relatively high, and we can see this. We can actually quite quite easily see this in this angle right here or these angles of the shoulders right there they're definitely raised up so that's an easy confirmation right there one other thing i will mention is that if you look if you just take a look this is a relatively skinny guy and this is important this is important to know relatively skinny guy but he seems to be having a distended 
abdomen. Now, again, I, there's, there's been some screening for pathology, so we know he's fine. It's not like a liver problem or a digestive problem, to our knowledge. But he has a disproportionate abdominal area. This curve going on here doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I'll back that up simply by saying it doesn't make sense with the curve we've got going on through here. If we had, let's say, a big extension like that, if we had a big gap like this was all empty space here, I'd be like, okay, at least that makes sense. Lumbar extension is pushing the gut anteriorly. No problem. But realistically, what we actually have is the opposite of that. We have relatively flat lumbars here. This is probably about, yeah, it's probably like the 12th rib, so 12-ish area, and there's there's L5-ish, give or take. And then the pelvis kicks in right about there. So we're, we're looking at something definitely strange going on. What's probably happened, and, and you can you know kind of understand this, hopefully you can understand this, is that the thorax, this structure, the thorax, the rib cage really, here has dropped forward a bit. It has actually come forward. Oh, look, I can animate this. So oh, magic. Oh, it's dropped forward. Okay, that made it worse. Anyways, it has come come forward. And so when it drops forward, understand that there's a respiratory diaphragm underneath that, attaching all these things together. And so when you drop the weight down on top of that, down on top of the viscera, the respiratory diaphragm sits on the viscera. There's your small intestine, large intestine, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, all that stuff. Spleen too. Can't forget the spleen. It can't go backwards because there's a spine there, especially not a flex spine. So it has to go forward. It can't go down fully because there's, you know, deep pelvic organs. So it has to outpouch a little bit. Those abdominal muscles will allow some outpouching. That's where we can sometimes get this. So later I'll back up some of what I'm saying here with some of the twists and turns through the thoracic spine, the rib cage, but that seems to be what's happening here. He's a little too far forward, doesn't have anywhere to go backwards because you run into the spine, so he goes forwards, bit of pressure in the abdomen comes out. This is fine, it's, it's not ideal, but that seems to be what's happening. As many confirmations as we can get. That's that's always the best thing we can do. Okay, moving on to the pelvis. So what seems to be going on with the pelvis, I'll tell you, I'll be completely honest. In the past, it's always been difficult for me to make a really good call on where the pelvis is, just based on some videos, you know, videos or, or some pictures. But the pelvis is sitting about here. This is an anonymate or the fusion of the three bones ilium, ischium, and pubis, and so that's that's give or take it right there. Not my best drawing, but it'll do. And there's, let's say, the sacrum right about there. So that's how it's kind of normally sitting. What seems to have happened in his case, I'm just going to get rid of that for a second, what seems to have happened is his case, is that we actually have a set of opposing curves. So again, we've got something pushing forward here, something pushing backwards here. There's not too much in the back of the pelvis region to put back. So it's got to be that we have an anterior tilt to this pelvis, bit of an anterior rotation. This would be more of a bilateral thing. See, that fits a little bit better. It's almost like I did that on purpose. Fits a little bit better when we do that. So this is pushing back. This is a bit of a weird set of curves going on here. And again, I'm not expecting to find anything normal because we have some, you know, weird situations. We have we have a little bit too much going on for it to be an easy open and shut case, if you will. And, and this means that because of the hip position, we've got, remember, we've got these externally rotated hips here. Let me draw that with a better color, something you can actually see. Maybe another, another shade of purple, right? There we go, everybody's favorite. Anyways, with that, we've got externally rotated hips. That's what we're that's what we're calling on that one. That would mean that would actually allow for that. Those two motions go relatively well together. We externally rotate rotate the hips. The pelvis can drop anteriorly. That's this direction, in case you didn't know. With that, we're gonna have some lengthening of the tissues. There we go. So as that drops forward, 
the posterior sides of gluteus medius and, and minimus tend to stretch out. It might get shorter in the front, though. Even though, and this is interesting, even though that maintains shortness in some of the deep external rotator muscles of the hip. That's the gemelli, obtuator, externus, those ones, internus as well. Of course, piriformis. How could I forget that? Anyways, those will be maintained short, but these ones will get relatively long by comparison. So we've definitely got some hip stuff to contend with there. Again, just based on position. Now we can take it even further. Take it even further. Um, oh, and I'll say this too. Actually, uh, I mentioned this before. So we did something where he was bending forward again with the toes together and the heels apart. This actually puts a little extra strain because as it basically it, it does the opposite. It externally rotates things. It puts a little bit more strain into these tissues here, these guys. And so when he bent forward, it was uncomfortable and painful to drop into this. So again, they're already in that state. Probably means we've got some already lengthened, over-exaggerated tissues. And so that's causing some of the discomfort and likely the instability he's noticed in his hips as well. Because he's walking on the wrong surface of them and he's not tracking effectively with them. Conversely, and I'll just say this quickly, when we reversed things, when we, we flipped the toes, so the, the toes were pointed out and the heels were together, there was no discomfort in bending forward, or, or minimal anyway. So you can, you can, you know, with different movements, cross, compare, or, or rule out certain things. Now with that, with all this talk of pelvis, we need to talk about that lumbar spine. So I'll just say that I'm fairly confident, just based on the look again, just based on the look, that's that's the starters, but how everything loads up, I mean, that's more of a case. But based on the look, we've probably got a flattened, what you might call a flexed lumbar spine. Those two are essentially synonymous, or synonymous for our purposes. The lumbar spine doesn't really flex fully. It, it should not flex too much. It should never do. If you see this in a lumbar spine, you know you've got a real problem. But uh, flexion is flatness in this case. Now, this is a harsh curve. If we've got something going forward here and something, you know, technically ba as backwards as it can get here, we've got a really rough transition point between these two. So my guess, I'm saying the lumbar spine above L5 is flat, but at L5, it's probably very pushed forward. So this thing is, has been shoved well forward. It is in an extended position. So that's that's a big deal because we've got a sudden transition zone. And, and we are supposed to have a transition zone um, as we go from lumbar spine to pelvis because it transitions from fully encased in bone in the pelvis to not totally encased in bone as we see in lumbar spine. But that's drastic and it's probably not very happy. This one, again, you'd really have to test through palpation. I'm making a call here. I'm fairly confident in it, but we know we've got something going on very close to this region, at the very least. Something that needs to be dealt with by someone at some time. Could get more specific than that, eh? Okay. Moving on. One thing, got to go back up to the top. Just need to erase some of this. Give me just a, just a sec here. So with all this going on with all this stuff hang on a second here let me just erase this never mind i can't anyways uh with all this stuff we've probably got something going on at the oa now i had to blank out the face the jaw is give or take right right about there and it's some pretty close proximity if you look at this head shape versus the neck here We've got very likely a flexed occiput on the atlas. So what you call an AO joint or OA joint, however you want to name that. And then even down as low as C2, we're probably doing this little bit of a thing. What often happens, you would think, this is, this is always funny, but you would think as we flex the head, basically the head's going this way and this will be coming back. You would think the jaw would come forward to allow for space to gap off so that it can maintain opening when it gets flexed through here. But what actually seems to happen is that draw contracts, it gets pulled 
backwards into the flexion, giving even less space and making it harder to move that jaw effectively, turns out. And he did mention some jaw discomfort, some, some jaw pain and tightness. So that's definitely relevant in this case. It's not ideal that it does this. It's a bit funny that it, it, it does this, that it, it flexes and gets all even more compacted together. But that seems to be what happens. So that needs to be dealt with. Moving on. Taking a look, let's take a look at this back. Again, we noticed there was something going on with the shoulders already. And I'll tell you right now, we're going to confirm this. Like once we show some video, it'll be a little bit more obvious. But just from a visual inspection, it's as if that neck is pushed towards the left. As if it if it done something to that effect. Um, it's not just a bend because we actually have a relatively straight uh, line here. But it's like you took the whole thing as a block and shifted it, and now it's pushed sideways. Funny thing, this is always one of those weird terminology things, but how you name this is you say it's translated to the left as if something had gone like this. So it's, it's, it's as if the cervical spine had gone like that. But what that means is because now we have a bit of space, it will fold much easier to the right so though it's translated left it'll bend easier to the right and you'll see that you'll see that in the video now another thing we do have to add on to onto this that the truth is he's in a challenging field there's a fair amount of stress and so it's very common to get shoulder tension in this area it's very common to get muscular tension through the trapezius scm all you know uh scalenes as well but it's, it's very common to get neck tension when we're in a higher stress environment. So it has to be taken into account. You can't be without stress, that's impossible. But when you add that to other problems, it just exacerbates it that much worse. Another thing I'll point out, we've got scapula that are a bit on level. That's, you can't see it fantastic in this, this image, but understand that the scapula on this side is eh, a fair bit higher than this one. So they're being held up partially through tension, but usually, when you see scapula that are quite in level, you know that the rib cage, which those scapulas sit on, they're probably not, that rib cage is probably not stable itself, or it's in a weird position also, because the thoracic spine rib cage is the base of support for the arm inclusive of the scapula, because it sits right on it. So you have to take that into consideration. We've also got, and this will get more and more clear, Got a nice fold in the skin there, telling us something that's going on. And then we've got some different kind of shapes of muscle going on. So we know there's some twists and turns in there. So I'll play this video in just a second. But notice right away we've got some flattening through here. And just based, based on the way the shadows are, We've got different muscle tones going on, different kind of compositions going on. This flat spot in particular is going to come up. And I guess I'll just play this video now. So look as he goes to the right. Look how far he can bend to the right. Again, we say, we're say we saying he's bending to the right. He's translated left at the base of that neck, those lower segments, probably around that C5, 6, 7 area. And then as he goes into the spine and thoracic cage, he's having to force his way through. There's actually a fair amount of effort just to get down to what I would really say is a reasonable level. Comes back up. Now look at this. Look when he goes to the left here. Look how far he can, only this far he can turn his neck. Let me just cross compare that. So go back for a second and just look how far he gets his neck on this side. He bends his neck really well to that right side, but when he goes back, to the left here, he engages his shoulder much more rapidly. So he can only bend his neck so far, then his shoulders immediately start moving and he's trying to bend to this side. Notice too, we've got an just a little extra area here. So this was a little bit prominent. Again, we identified this area before. It was prominent around the T10 area. Notice how it stays pretty much there the entire time. That means it's probably rotated backwards towards us, it's stuck backwards on this side. And so we have to assume that the opposite side is bent to the right side, 
rotated to the left. One final thing I just wanted to say on this, this neck translation effect we seem to have going on here is just that based on its position, I'm going out on a limb here, but based on its position, it was probably a side impact thing, like he was struck hard from the side at one point in, in one of could be any of many injuries as we're growing up. And so that kind of jammed it up, pushed it, and now it's being held there by potentially a number of different tissues. Okay, now we just need to overlay what we saw in the last video and static images with what we're seeing in this series of images. Now this is from a video, again, I couldn't blank out the face, so I just kind of took some screenshots of a progression, just keeping it really simple. Just to quickly go through, notice what you see right away. Notice kind of the the flat spots and the excessively curved spots. So this is more curved, this is more flat, it's a little more flat here. And as we go down, look at the type of curve this maintained. And this is real bent there. And this is getting, oh, real, real bent here. Again, maintained. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna say a bunch of technical stuff. Say a bunch of technical stuff here, but just stay with me, stay with me. I'll try to keep it real simple. So I'm gonna say, in the C4 to 6 area, that's the cervical spine or cervical spine if you're in the UK, we've got extension. So it's being pushed forwards. It's being pushed like that. This is what we call like an extension curve to the point where it's a bit of an anterior translation as if it was, again, shoved in that direction. Below that, in almost all cases, because we've got an extension, we probably need a flexion below it, just below it. Let me do that a bit different just to be much more clear with it. So we've probably got a, a flexion in that like C7 to T3 area. See how this is a little, just a little bit of a bump here. It's not huge, but it's something. And then as we get lower than that, we've got a bit of a flattened spot right about here. Again, it's going forward, backwards, forwards really easy, forwards, backwards, forwards. So we can see how it's kind of flattened out through here and should be even able to see that even better in this case. So again, this maintained extension, flexion, and then a big, what I'm assuming is a big extension in about the T4, well, at least a six area. And then it starts to, it starts to, startens is not a real word, it starts to really flatten, sorry, not flatten, starts to flex through here, and we can even see that more. Again, very, very exaggerated. Very exaggerated here. Probably T6 all the way around, you know, about to T, T10. And again, I don't really think I need to make a huge case for the lumbar spine being, being flat. This is almost, this is almost a curve through there. You know, this is getting a little more extreme uh, than it should be. You know, mobility is good to a point. And one more thing I do want to point out, this maintained the whole way through, I think I said this already, but it maintained the whole way through. This curve through here, it stayed, and that's a big deal. When it stays in every kind of position, every progression you take, it means it's probably pretty stuck. Not every single vertebrae, I understand, not every single vertebrae and tissue is stuck, but several of them are, and enough of them are spread throughout to be a problem. And that's that's something that means something for the whole body and the way it works together. Now this is just the same thing from a posterior view, a behind view. It's just bending forward. One thing I'll, I'll point out again is that his shoulders, we've definitely got a better view of the raised shoulders as he bends forward, as he engages this roundedness. These tend to pop up just a, just a little bit more it shows with that of course we can again see you know we saw it in the video already but we see this flat area and i, I i'm going to say t4 to 6 it's a small region but but it's very prominent you can see how we've got a, a bit of a, a space almost here as it as if it's been pushed forward if you will a flat spot and i know it's about t6 simply because the you can see you can actually see oops there we go you can actually see the ends of the scapula the off level scapula but the scapula nonetheless here and so that would mean the t7s here that means you know one above this this spot about t6 so easy easy way of looking at that not not too difficult anyone could do that stuff
Anyways, we would say, we're going to say too, I'm going to say actually, that we've got some funny rotations going on. Uh, if you remember, we identified this area here as he bends forward. Smooth, relatively flat through here. This spot here, relatively prominent, so it's kind of coming back at us. I'm guessing, just based on the way things are looking, we've got a rotation backwards towards us on that left side. We do call that left rotation simply because, you know, to get technical here, if you're looking at the vertebrae from the top, there's a vertebrae. If it was to spin like this, so the body is pointed towards the left, that's the left side here, that's the right, call that a left rotation. You feel it more because now that vertebrae, you feel more of the vertebrae prominent there because that's the arm of the vertebrae, uh, the TVP or transverse process, and the body of the vertebrae is there. So you'd say this is rotated left. It's a funny thing. I think they reverse it, uh, engineers reverse it, but you know, that's, that's where we're at. So <laughs> we're going to call it. And then we've kind of got the same thing going on a little bit lower down, maybe at around T9. Usually this means that we've got a, a kind of a rapid transition the zone through here. So it's probably not too happy. Okay. Anyways, bunch of stuff going on. Now, right now, I need to say something possibly controversial. I'm not going to sketch anything here. I'm just going to say it. Hope for the best. All this spinal stuff, all this wibbly wobbly spinal stuff through here, all the bends and twists, at this stage of the game, it's all neat, but it's really irrelevant. You know, someone could actually even give you a far more detailed version of this. Again, if you had live hands-on palpation, you could probably get uh, a, a better workup on, on what's going on. But the reality is, there's such a large amount of the spine that is involved in this, that is at a low mobility point, that someone just needs to get in there and get anything moving, and get as much of it moving as you possibly can, just to see what's actually there, to see what actually sticks around it and holds on. Uh, a bit of a top-to-bottom overhaul first or a, a general treatment, if you will, full body work, just to see what happens. That's what actually matters right now. Because you'll notice in all of the complaints and all of the history, there's actually no complaint of back pain. It's really like shoulders up, neck, head, jaw, that kind of thing, cracking shoulder. Um, and, and the reality is, if you got that spine moving again, it might be that the shoulder pain goes away the you know rib thoracic neck and head pain that tends to disappear but it turns out the back would start hurting this is not uncommon in fact it seems like a bad thing but the patient might actually get a little bit worse in a few pace, places before you see a bigger improvement and this is this is not a bad thing at all it's actually the body accurately reporting its condition. It's accurately telling you that this is not working right. Whereas it's so immobile right now, it's probably not really feeling too much of it. And that's a really bad thing. Proprioception is important. We have to have it. We have to have it just to do basic stuff, to feel safe when we're exercising, for instance. So when we lack that, when we lack the ability to perceive with accuracy what our body is doing and where our body is in space, how much it's capable of moving or if it's capable of moving, that can be, that can be a problem. So with that highly controversial statement, I'm going to say something downright silly. He's just kind of squished and twisted, you know, if you really want to look at it, he's kind of just squished and, and wound up in a few spots, and we need to get rid of that. I'm going to say that if I was someone trying to help this person, this is kind of the order I think would be important. Whoever helps this person, I'm, I'm hoping it will happen. They're going to come up with their own plan, but we've got we've got to make some some sense out of it. You know, this is not a this is not an easy single planar fix. You know, we've got multiple things going on in multiple places. He's not just bent over in general. We don't just need to sit him up and strengthen his back muscles. It's it's too much. He's compressed. He's wound up like a spring, or more like a series of springs. Really. That being said, again, I can I can mention a few specific things that I I think will make sense because it's going to pass through the multiple regions and be a little more relevant than it is irrelevant. 
tying this treatment together anyways. So again, I'm not the one to do this, but if you want to unwind, I'm really interested in this foot. This foot is something. This foot is bugging me and it should bug you too. That's where I'd like to start. But to start at the foot, you really have to get it to be loaded properly. You have to actually be using it effectively. And that seems to be coming from the pelvis. Again, I'm not seeing much from the knee. So I'm thinking hip, the hip pelvis interaction first. Reminding you that just as we go through this, just a reminder, we've got external rotation of those hips. An externally rotated hip, bilaterally, is the technical term for that. So those small tissues, those tiny little tissues of the hip on that back side, there's a hip joint on that back part of the hip, are shortened. They're coming together here. They are short. So we probably have to deal with that. And on top of that, sitting like directly on top of that, again, we've got that relatively anterior pelvis. We've got the sacrum sitting, you know, back against their pubic symphysis. There we go. Anyway, we've got that relatively anterior pelvis. So short, short attachments between the greater trochanter sacrum and anonymate bone. But as well, because that pelvis is anterior, switching back to this shot, because this pelvis is anterior, Something's got to be holding it in that direction. And so more than likely, it would be a combination of the iliacus and psoas. I'm going to go a little more iliacus myself. So that's the iliacus attaching into this way too big. Well, there we go. Attaching into the greater, uh, lesser decanter, pardon me. We got lesser decanter area of the femur. Not a great femur. It's not my best work. But anyways, femur in this would be bilateral. Of course, so this would be like a shortened tissue, a little bit, a little bit on the psoas. The reality is the psoas seems to be oftentimes what we call a, a lumbar extender, but we do have a flex lumbar spine. I would say that in certain positions, especially as we get into bigger flexions, you can actually maintain lumbar flexion. So it's not purely a lumbar extensor. A bit of messing around with that one, but that seems to be seems to be what I've seen. And that's from the front, but actually from the back, if you just look at the direction, the angle of pull on what we call the erector spinae, we can actually get it held up from the back too. So if the iliacus, which would be right here, here is pulling it anterior, pulling that pelvis bilaterally anterior, well, we can yank that pelvis up from the back. So this is pulling down. Well, we can actually yank that pelvis up from the back because we've got erector spinae that basically go like that. And as this angle of pull comes around like that, it can lift it up the back while it's being pulled down at the front. So this is technically anterior pelvis. Turns out too, that because of this angle of pull, it actually does make a fair amount of sense because we're squishing and squashing this junctional zone together, this L5 region, which should give us support for the theory that this is anterior translated. So that, just understand that as I'm identifying these short muscles, what I'm saying is these are the ones that need to be worked on. These are the ones that are actively contracting and that they're holding on to neural tone. They're holding a neural tone which can be reduced and so we can change the position or they're shortened and held in this position, uh, thickening or fibrosis or whatever you want to call it, that's holding this more statically than is to be broken down either through myofascial release or strengthening or, or some combination. In any case, this gives us the ability, this combination of tissues between the front and the back gives us a real easy way to hold that pelvis anterior on top of the hip with externally rotated hip push forward L5, and a relatively flex lumbar spine. And now that we have that, now that we actually have this stable base worked out, so now we've got this moving again, and we've got our position that's holding well, we actually now have changed the direction of pull on the abdominal tissues, the many abdominal tissues, you know, the, the obliques and the rectus abdominis, for instance. So we've 
we've changed the base of support for that. So we can actually start to move up into the thorax from there. So we can start working on this thorax. Remember we had all these kind of confusing twists and turns. And so we have a base of support. Again, we have, we've established some kind of a base of support for the abdominal muscles to pull off of. Well, the angles of these things, and even the lats you can include, the angles, look at the, the curvature there. You can say it's, it's pulled down, the side's comparatively a little, little bit up, a little bit twisted. This part's back, forward. We have to consider all that. So first getting the thorax straightened out, we have to be relatively sure it's not being pulled and twisted. And a lot of this can come from the obliques, not just the back muscles, it turns out, because twisting that thorax is, is something that the abdominal muscles actually do. They do it quite well. Now, that being said, we've got to get this guy unsquished. And when I say squished, you know, it's just a fun way of saying he's generally a little more flexed than he is extended. We want to start softening the tissues. We really want to start softening the tissues that link up the thoracic vertebrae to the rib cage and everything in between because there's actually a ton of soft tissue. That's the posterior deep intrinsic spinal muscles and the big erector muscles around that. And then even all of the small muscles in between the ribs too, those are important as well. So getting those actually mobilized turns out helps you mobilize a little bit of everything. Then we can start to be a little more specific and it matters. Not that those twists and turns don't matter. You know, when I was saying before that it's not relevant now, it doesn't mean it won't be relevant in the future. But we need to get this this guy up. Now with a flexion, understand that as we, we flex forward, let me just pull up that uh, other image. So here we go. As we're flexing forward, understand that now you, you're generally just falling forward through here, of course, but as we're flexing forward, it's the front side that is short. And that means the back part here is allowing the forward falling by relaxing. It is allowing it. The front is active and short. The back is passive and lengthening. So it's not really when we see a, a general flexion or someone falling downward into gravity. It's not really a, a back problem per se in the idea of correcting it or, or getting the space to move into a more normal position. It is more the front, believe it or not. And this is confusing because many times back pain can be a result of the front being too short. So in any case, We've got to get this guy straightened out. And that is inclusive of not just the abdominal muscles. Definitely we've got the, again, the obliques. Those will pull downward. Anything vertical, anything that runs at least partially vertical. Those obliques and the rectus abdominis can do that. But consider, too, that we've got the arm muscles to go after as well. Consider we've got pectoralis minor pectoralis major to contend with. Those run semi-vertically, and so they can pull you down and forward. They can have an effect on the, the arm position that makes it so that you're being leaned into it. If the arms are in front, and if you notice this hand, a little bit obscured now, but you notice this hand is a little bit too far forward, that's a bit of extra weight all the time to hang on to. So working through this front line, believe it or not, will often have a big effect on the posture of the back. It always seems so counterintuitive, but uh, that's, that is the reality. That's often how it works. And one more thing, just as a cross comparison, you'll notice that the flexor muscles, uh, again, if you want to hold on to uh, flexion, you want to be short in the front, if that's your goal, you know, not that it is, but if that's your goal, for whatever reason, it, the, these would be short and actively contracting. However, when we start to get these flat spots, when we start to get areas where it's, you know, it is relatively flat, those are often the product of extensor muscles. So we could say uh, in a lot of cases that these are the reaction too. They increase in tone to prevent a further falling forward. Some of it's not preventable. Again, this is certainly some, there's some certainly flexed areas in here, but the extensor tone, it firing off some, some nerves here 
prevents and holds those extensor muscles will contract and pull and make it so that it stays even within a general flexion parts of it stays extended so you can be relatively upright so at least you can keep your eye line level you may be gradually falling forward regardless but your eye line is level now some of that's going to have to be work on we can't have these kinds of of curves in here without there being rigidities that need to be specifically taken care of but that being said these are, are very much reactionary, these extensionaries. They're important, but they're reactionary. So it's about where you want to spend your time. So then, once we have a good handle on everything below it, we can start to straighten that neck out. We can start to work on, let's say, the SCM tension, the traps, which we know are a problem, and even the scalenes getting, getting in there at least getting things moving better and flexible you know taking care of let's say this funny little translation we got going on there just so we can make a little bit of make a little bit of space between the head and the shoulders those should be two separate entities not running together so much once we've got that straightened out and understand is we've got that straightened out all the way up into the c2 we've taken out that flexion we've taken out that side bending we've got a relatively level body then we have a properly loaded foot and we can go right back to that foot and we can probably start to look at that and maybe maybe it will respond to some adduction some moving into a more normal position but that being said of course that being said you're probably going to want to work a little bit everywhere a little bit all over the place that's what makes sense based on how the tissue works based on how the structure is loading itself always a little bit everywhere just to be a bit safe spend too much time in one spot you kind of miss the point or you force something to work harder than it should so just to bring it back home just to say what kind of makes sense at this point based on some of the described issues this person is having he mentioned he's having tension to the rib cage rib cage <laughs> into the head he can't move that area really well at all and the rib cage is especially contorted in this position understand that that really should be the case hopefully it makes sense to you at this point when i say if this is all twisted up through here if this is all bound up he's going to have a much harder time moving that head he's going to have a, a harder time moving it without straining some tissues in between so because we have almost no movement through here he has to work excessively hard through this neck region and this goes all the way into the front because we also have attachments that go all the way up from the thorax into the jaw there's several muscles in fact they, they go through the hyoid but you get the idea so there's there's attachment points between these two things. So it's not unreasonable that he's getting all this uh, tension. And in fact, we've got, especially when it comes to the rib cage. So if this was, let's do a little darker blue. If this was the sternum right here. There is approximately the sternum. Attaching all these ribs is not going to be accurate, but close enough. Attaching all these ribs is something called the costochondral cartilage, uh, triple C. And it is a cartilage, and though it is very strong, it does not mean it's invincible. And as we twist through the rib cage, as we put lots of big turns in it, that cartilage goes under a little bit of extra tension. So he should be feeling a little bit of irritation through there as that cartilage gets kind of distorted, as it does funny warps and warps and wefts to talk about fabric. Anyways, as it does kind of funny positions, it should feel kind of uncomfortable. That's very reasonable now for the almost exact same reason if we've got a bunch of uh, instability in the shoulders clunking or clicking again if you don't have the stability here or if you don't have the movement through here what really should happen when we go to lift up a shoulder is as we try to gain this position we bring it up it should be that the thorax we get a bit of a bend through here we get a little bit of a, a side bend and it's multiple points it's going to side it's going to go back and forth of course but it should accommodate the motion of the shoulder when we lose that motion when we don't have that 
that bending. What we often end up with is trying to reach to the same level, We're still trying to grab that thing up top, but we end up pushing our shoulder that much harder to do it. We push it harder and harder. We push it higher because we know, well, I should be able to reach it. I've done it before. I'll do it again. And so what ends up happening is that shoulder gets pushed a little further down and so it gets a little less stable the more you use it or the harder you push it. In a way this is a totally natural compensation. It's normal, it's not good, but it is normal. It's trying to do this. It's, it's trying to achieve the same goals with less quality material. And so if we can restore some of the quality of that material then we can we can often see that it reduces some of these issues that's going on and hopefully many of these issues. Hey guys, as usual, I hope that made some sense and I hope you had a good time too because yeah, this was a lot of fun for me.